Good evening, watching live Revelation TV. We just want you to know that tonight is going to be a special night. They always are on, on the late show, but tonight's guest is Jay Smith, who is going to be uh, spelling it out a little bit with regards to the apologetics, particularly with uh, the Islamic studies and uh, Islam in particular. Jay, we just made it tonight, by God's grace, but uh, welcome to Revelation TV and to The Late Show. Thank you, Howard. It's good to be here. Yeah. Well, we're, I'm just as keen to now know a little bit about your background so that people can understand where you're coming from and also the ministry that you're doing and uh, carrying on right now, which is uh, Profanda Center of Apologetics. Yeah, I've been w uh, involved with Islam for 35 years now. and. Um, the work that we're doing here in London. I was brought to London in 1992. I came because of growing radicalism here in this city and I went to the UK consulate in New York City back in 1992 with the intention of getting a visa which uh, takes about a year and a half to get normally. I walked in and, and the consular general looked at me and says, why should we let you come to England? And I said, well, you need me. You have a real problem with a growing radicalism in Islam and you have nobody that really understands them. That's my area of expertise. I have two master's degree and one in Islamics from Fuller Seminary. I know apologetics. This is my area that I studied. Uh, he, I said, you don't have anybody that not only under, understands it, but knows the solution for them. And so he looked at his watch and he says, well, if you have about 45 minutes, I'll give you your visas before you even leave. So I walked out the door 45 minutes later with visas to come here with my whole family. And I've been here ever since for 25 years. And what we're doing, Howard, we're actually engaging with the most radical Muslims that exist. These are the ones that you see on the news all the time. Many of these fellows, uh, people like Anjam Chowdhury, he's a good friend. Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, he's a good friend. These are the leaders of the Mahajirun party. I've been working with them. I've been engaging with them. I've been debating them uh, off and on all around the world. Uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, he, I've even had six debates with him. These are the fellows that I'd engage with and take on. And what I do, or what we do at Fander, we confront their foundations. Now, we learn our material by going down to Speaker's Corner. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been there. Have you been there? I have. Okay. Yes. Have you been on the ladder at all? No, but I was to, I believe I was challenged many years ago by the Lord to go there because I used to go into the streets uh, witnessing on okay. my own. And uh, the Speaker's Corner was something I just didn't, to be honest, I didn't have the courage. Well, I wasn't been, a good enough there, speaker. We've been there for 20, I've been there for 25 years, starting in 1992, and I go every Sunday down to Speaker's Corner. For the first three or four years, I was on the ground like everybody else. And then in, 19, in 1994, I got knocked out cold by about 60 Muslims. They were punching, and the police got very scared that I would, uh, something more serious would happen. So they asked me to get up on a ladder so they could see me at all times. Gotcha. So uh, <clears throat> we've been I there ever you? since. Good, good for you. This is very interesting because uh, we have something in common a little, a little okay. at the moment. Um, we both know the speaker's corner. We both know Sheikh Mohammed Bakri. So you know I've him interviewed personally. him uh, okay. several times. To, uh, well, in fact, the second day we broadcast, uh, I asked him to come on. Um, I also went to interview him um, before 9-11. Mm, yeah. uh, very interesting. I was at their premises, and Amjan Chowdhury. I was going. It was next on the list, but I spent three hours with uh, Bakri that um, we didn't get to do Amjan Chowdhury as well at the time. But fascinating <coughs> because it is good to engage with such people. But I, I use. I heard the phrase used. He's my friend. Now, can you explain what you mean as a friend um, Sheikh, when you're yeah, perhaps me, apologizing? Probably the best way to explain, if you're, if you're, if you're going to uh, um, define a radical Muslim, just look at the word itself. Radical means going back to the root. A radical number is a root number. If you're going to go back to the root of Islam, you're going to have to come back to this book, the Quran. This is the root of Islam. This is what they uh, follow. This is what they read. The way they interpret this book, the way they, they read it, is to follow the example of their prophet Muhammad. So you have the book and you have the man, the book and the man. Now a radical Muslim will read the book and follow the man. It's as simple as that. Well, now, wouldn't you say the same about a Christian? Here you go. So that's where I come in. Well, what do we do? Well, I, if I'm a radical Christian, then I better go back to my root, which is this book. But the way I interpret this book is by the man, Jesus Christ. So I go back to a book and a man. So we both start from the same paradigm. And that's what Sheikh Omar Bakri and I saw almost immediately. When I met him in 19... 93. It was the first time I met him. And he invited me to go to his school. 
uh, there in Tottenham. That's and right. after we got together mm -hmm. and know each other, he actually came and had me do some teaching for him in his school in Tottenham. He was known as the Ayatollah of Tottenham. And the first time I went to his school, he introduced me to his students this way. He said, this is my favorite Christian, but this will be the first man I kill when Islam comes to Britain. What an introduction. <laughs> But I didn't, it didn't bother me whatsoever, yeah. Howard, because he was being as honest to his yeah. scriptures. And yeah. I knew exactly what he was saying. He was referring to Surah 9, Ayah 5. That's chapter 9, verse 5. He was referring to Surah 8, Ayah 39. Chapter 8, verse 39, which st both stipulate, slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them, besiege them, lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. Surah 8, Ayah 39, slay the unbeliever until there is no more fitna, which means no more unbelief. Right. Surah 47, Ayah 4, cut off the heads of the unbeliever. This is verse 4, the first three verses tell what a believer is and what an unbeliever is, and then it says what to do with the unbeliever. So I knew where he was coming from. If he was being consistent to his book, he would have to do that to me. The beauty, beauty about it is that if I'm consistent to my book, I do just the opposite. So we engage book with book, and we engage man with man. Now we've been doing this at Speaker's Corner every Sunday. You, we were there, and that's why my voice has gone a bit today. Uh, I was there on the ladder for three hours yesterday, uh, up on the ladder. And we, uh, we always zero in on what the Quran says versus what the Bible says. We zero in on who Muhammad is versus who Jesus is. We zero in on who Allah is versus who Yahweh is. And we do like with like, comparison with comparison. We do that purposely because we find you're going to find many Muslims here in Britain who do not understand radicals. They say that's nothing to do with Islam. Islam is not, uh, is not, is not a violent religion. It's a very peaceful religion. And for the vast, vast majority of Muslims living in this country, it is a peaceful religion because they don't read their Quran. <laughs> Sorry to laugh. There are many Christians that would say all kinds of things about Jesus Christ here in Britain who would claim to be Christians, but they've never read the Bible. Right. And they make all kinds of claims that they don't know about. And that's why when you and I go to church and we listen to our pastors, we demand that they read from the Bible. We demand that they open it. We demand that they exegete it. And then we demand that they apply it correctly. Otherwise, they would not be, we would not let them continue in their pulpits. If we are going to demand that of our pastors, then we have to demand the same thing of Muslims and demand it of their clerics. Sheikh Omar Bakari, I have to admit, he was the man that used the Quran better than anybody I came across. And that's why he was so influential, and that's why he was so powerful here amongst young radical men. We got on really well as well, and now I'm starting to understand why. Because I had three hours with him, and he didn't want to let me go. <laughs> and I was asking all sorts of questions. Um, the thing is that I, I would like to say that to make the most of tonight, I want to invite our guests, who are our audience, uh, to write in live at revelationtv.com. Ask Jay some of the questions that you would always want uh, to get a decent answer on. And tonight's going to be the night that I think you're going to get it. And it is the last chance, isn't it? Yes, I'm leaving on Saturday, going back to America. After 35 years. 25, oh, 25 years. Here, but 35, 35 years in Islam, but 25 years in I London. I see. Right. Okay. So, um, Jay, I am really pleased that we can make good use of this time. A Christian, and we're seeing in our nation now, uh, where they're giving in all the time to uh, the ways of the world, you know, the, you know, to be more modern. I was reading in the newspaper today, you know, we, the church has to accept yeah. some of the things which they've recently changed the laws on, particularly on same-sex marriage, uh, and that we are supposed to, you know, adopt those. The church has to change. It has to move with the times. This literally was in uh, the newspapers today. So is there a problem with Christianity, let alone the, what you're trying to integrate or relate to with the Quran? Just what about us first? Well, there's a real problem here in Britain. I think there's a problem right across Europe, but especially Britain. Britain I, is the only country in Europe that has no restrictions on Muslims. Have you noticed that? There's no restrictions. There's no burqa ban. There's no minaret ban. There's no... There's uh, a you, Sharia you've law even, ban. You've even introduced Sharia courts as of 2009, you have now over 80 of these Islamic courts that are alongside British courts. Now that has been done by no other European country. Can you then understand why Britain is such a magnet for Muslims, especially the most radical kind? And that's why you've had, you have 2,000 Muslims from Britain who have joined ISIS, another 2,000 who are in prison who want to join ISIS, another 3,000 that, uh, that are on 24-hour watch by your police, and another 20,000 Muslim young men and women who are under surveillance because of the fact that they are radicalized. That's 27,000 Muslims that you either have in 
Syria or want to go to Syria or under surveillance because of the fact they want to join ISIS. Now, how many Muslims do you have who have joined your military? I don't know. 450. Okay. Let's just do comparison right there. Right. Why is it there's such a movement of radicalization that's moved to the, to the right? Let's go this direction mm -hmm. since I'm like people who are mayor. watching from this side. Like the mayor They're, of London. That's right. Well, I wouldn't say the mayor of London is radical. He would not no, be no, radical. No, no, he's moved right. But, okay, but there, there is many Muslims who have become radicalized. Mm. When they did a survey on radicalism uh, back in 2001, right after the atrocities in 9-11, the next month in October, they did a survey to find out if Muslims here in Britain were radicalized, nominal, or liberal. And they found that 25% were, I'm sorry, 15% were radicalized. The vast majority were in the middle of what we would call nominal, that was 70%, and another 15% here on the left, liberal. A year later, in 2002, when they went back and asked the same question, do you support Al-Qaeda? Do you support Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri? This group had grown to 25% from 15%. When they did this survey five years later, this is 2006, they asked the same question and the group that was over here on the right had grown, which had been 15%, grown to 25%, was now 43%. Half almost half of all Muslims had become radicalized within five years, according to the statistics. Now we're in 2017. They haven't done any more surveys. I would suggest over half now of the ones we're coming across have moved to the right, have moved back to this book, are going back to scripture, and they're going back to their prophet Muhammad as their example. If that is the case, we have to wake up. The, this country has to wake up, and especially the church has to wake up. And there's a reason for that, Howard, and we can talk more about right. that. Well, I'm sure uh, we problems tonight I think with our stripes but straps but live at revelation tv.com and also if you want to get onto the website uh, for Jay it's info at pafanda, uh, dot uk and that's spelt P well that's the email if they want to contact us yes if they want to go just go up on Fander films on YouTube go up to YouTube and go to Fander films okay and we have YouTube there if they want to uh, if they want to go on our website just Fander dot uk okay let's deal with some of the fundamental um, I, that we struggle with, especially yeah. as Christians, and we're trying to engage uh, with the Muslims because we're evangelistic after all. Uh, Absolutely. Okay, we can't just say, well, we don't agree with them and leave them alone. Uh, I admire you for actually taking 25 years of your life and uh, interacting with them, especially on Speaker's Corner, which can't be the most friendly of places. Uh, where do we start? Like you. you most people, you know, when there's a terrorist attack, um, they say, you know, people come out and say, okay, you know, how can they say Islam's a peaceful religion? Why, why is that an excuse amongst the Islamic uh, communities? Well, I, I think you're, see, you're seeing a real tussle happening within Islam right now. There's a real tug of war as to how they define Islam. Up until 2001, when, we, when I was at Speaker's Corner, every Sunday there was violence down there. I got beat up, I got my glasses broken. You can see where they gave me a scar here in my throat. We did have an awful lot of violence there. When 9-11 happened, suddenly the narrative changed, completely changed. And suddenly a religion that was not necessarily a violent religion, but they didn't really try to uh, defend against it. Suddenly now, in, in 2001, it became a religion of peace. And that's the narrative that's been for the last 16 years. We are a religion of peace. Muhammad is a man of peace. The Quran is a book of peace. Allah is a God of peace. And so that's the new narrative that now not only Muslims in Britain want to impose on, on the West. The government wants it. Your pundits want it. The police want it. Everybody wants to believe that Islam is a religion of peace. And it will remain peaceful as long as they live in Britain. Because the problem is, just look at its history. 1400 years is not, has not been a peaceful history. And if you look in, and uh, see just the enormous amount of violence that's happening around the world, perpetrated by Muslims, and not all of them radical. And you will see that this is growing and growing and growing. Um, we had, uh, you had Huntington, uh, Samuel Hall Huntington, who wrote a book in 1996 called The Clash of Civilization, it became a bestseller. Uh, and he was a Harvard professor. He wrote at 1996, now this is before, of course, 9-11. Um, he said, if you look at the world today, there are about 20 w wars that are happening around the world in 1996. 18 of them involve Muslim countries. And he said, at, he, at that time, he coined the term bloody borders. Islam has bloody borders. And what he meant by that, it was that 
every Muslim country was at war with either its neighbor or was at war with itself. Now this is before 9-11. This is before the world really woke up to radical Islam. We knew about it, I knew about it, and so that was one of the reasons why I've been engaging with radical Muslims ever since. But when he was made that claim back in 1996, there was an enormous furore around the world against him, saying you have no idea what you're talking about Muslims, my grocer next door, my, the Muslim neighbor right next door, they're as peaceful as you could be, the people I work with, they, they are always peaceful, and they are, of course they're peaceful. That's why they're in Britain. Many of them have come here to get away from their Muslim countries. Many of them have come here for educational reasons, for economic reasons. They don't want anything to do with Pakistan or India or Bangladesh especially because of the violence that is there. What they don't realize is that much of that violence can be traced right back to this book. It's not a cultural problem. It's not to do with because they have a bad culture in Pakistan. If you want to look and see, look at Pakistan and Bangladesh and compare it with India in the middle. They both have had the same amount of freedom uh, since the colonial time, since 1947. Look at their countries and look at their governments and then compare it with India, who's never had a coup. Mm -hmm. They've had the most, in fact, it's probably the greatest democracy on earth, the largest democracy on earth. They've always had a free change of government, but not so Pakistan and Bangladesh. So what's different between those three countries? It comes down to religion. It comes down to what Islam does to people, what it does to communities, what it does to the whole history in the last 1400 years. Because every country, every place that Islam has been, it has dominated. And it has eradicated the culture was there and introduced its own culture. And this is what people don't realize. Islam is much more than a faith. It's an entire way of life. And they're proud of it. They tell me that themselves. We are a 24-7 religion. How we walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep is all dictated by that book and by the man that, that, we, that models it for it. So where, basically, are, are the Muslims going wrong when you, when you uh, talk about the true religion out of, uh, out of all the religions? No, I'm very simply. When a Muslim comes up to me and says, Islam is religion of peace, I say, okay, here's your Quran. I want you to show me one verse of peace, one verse that says you're to have peace with me, a Christian. One verse. They'll jump in and I say, well, it says very clearly that there is no compulsion in religion. I said, do you know where that's found? That's in Surah 2, Ayah 256. I said, that has nothing to do with me. Read the entire verse and then read the verse that follows it in verse 257. And you will see that that has nothing to do with peace with anybody outside of Islam. It has to do with those Muslims who either uh, accept or reject Allah. And if you re accept or if you reject Allah, great shall be your perdition, shall you be in hellfire. Now tell me if there's no compulsion. So don't use that verse. And not with me. I did it with Lord Ahmed in the, in the, House, of, um, um, the House of Lords. I was there with Baroness Cox and we're trying to stop and shut down these Islamic courts. And he came in and he says, listen, why are you all upset about it? We're a religion of peace. And he quoted this verse, and he didn't know where it was from, so I had to tell him. And then he quoted it, and he says, well, in the Quran it says, if you are offended, defend yourself, but don't go beyond the limits. I said, do you know where that is? I said, that's in Surah 2, Ayah 190. Why don't you read the very next verse? Because what, how far are you not to go? What limits are you not to go beyond to defend yourself? In the very next verse it says, and slay them wherever you find them. Yeah. Now tell me, how, how can you defend against me once I'm dead? Yeah. So then he went to Surah 5, Ayah 32. And this is the favorite one, Howard. This is the one that David Cameron likes to use. This is the one that Obama used to use. Uh, these are the ones that all the pundits like to use, which starts and says, O children of Israel, he who takes the blood of one is if he takes the blood of all. But he who saves the blood of one is if he saves the blood the of all. That's a great verse. Yeah. <clears throat> I love it. But? There's a problem. Yeah. Who's it to? O children of Israel. Yes. This is for the Jews. It follows verse 31, mm -hmm. which is about Cain and Abel, Cain killing his brother, seeing a raven bury its partner, so he follows the example of the raven to bury his brother uh, Abel. And this is a redemption analysis on the blood of Abel. But that has nothing to do with anybody else but Jews. If you want to find out what has to do with us, read the very next verse, verse 33. Which says? Which says, He who does not accept Allah or his prophet, crucify them, and cut off their hands and feet on opposite ends. Now that's to do with you, Howard, and that's to do with any other Muslim who does not accept Allah or a prophet, which I don't. I refuse to accept Allah, the Allah of the Quran, and I will not accept Muhammad. 
I'm just reading this. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, I, was, I had a vacation. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd start to read the Quran. So this is what you do on your vacation. Yeah, right? I thought, well, no. Light it's, reading huh? yes. before you go to bed. That's it. But uh, right at the very beginning, now, uh, it's a bit hard for me to actually find. It's, it's before Surah 60, I should imagine. I don't know. But um, how to read this, because it's not as easily marked as the Bible. But it says, Verily, they who believe, that's Muslims, and they who follow the Jewish religion and the Christians and the Sebites, uh, whoever of these believeth in God and the last day and doeth which is right shall have their reward with their Lord. Fear shall not come <coughs> upon them and neither shall they be grieved. So in other words, they're saying that such persons, who, whether they're Jews or Christians, are really um, not to be killed, but to be uh, allowed to remain in peace. There are three, there are and three they will have a reward on the last day. In Surah 9, Ayah 29, <clears throat> also goes on beyond that, and <clears throat> says, For those who are the people of the book, that's Ali Kitab, make war upon them yes. until they pay the jizya tax. Yeah, right. That's the jizya that's reserved only for Christians and Jews and Zoroastrians. Now, that would confront that verse. Uh, dimis, is it? We're called dimiti, dimitud, yeah, dimit. and that's called yeah. dimitud, the, the, to be under yeah. servants. But then you get to Surah 5, Ayah 51, which says, Have nothing to do with Christians and Jews for they are friends of one another. So how does that come in? Because it's contradicting itself. All right. You have a law of what we call the law of abrogation. In Surah 2, Ayah 106. Mm -hmm. In Surah 16, Ayah 101 is the law of abrogation, which stipulates so that which latest. we give. We give Meccan, which would be the early surahs, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, that's called Mansuk, which would be uh, weak. We give something better, Nasik, which is strong. So you have verses that contradict. There's about 220 verses. Howard, that contradict each other in the Quran. And when you look at the first one, which is Mansuk, you always, always, always go to the latter one, which is Nasik, which means if you take the Quran and you just divide it in half, the first half is your, is your Nasik. This is Medinan. The second half are your Meccan. It goes backwards, you might say. So this is Medinan, that's Meccan, that comes first, this comes second, which means this part is more authoritative and abrogates ah, that part. I've never part. got that far, that's my problem. Well, you won't know this, and you won't know this unless you know Islamic theology. I have a doctorate in this area. This is my PhD. So th you can see why we have to go back to the Quran. We have to use this material. Now, once you look at the Quran and you see, whenever you have a contradiction, always, always, always go to the Medinan verses. And it's the Medinan verses where all the violent verses are. Right. Okay, okay. That's, where, that's where the problem lies. Okay, we're starting to get some emails and texts <coughs> coming in. Just to remind you, live at revelationtv.com and also the text number, which I can't remember because I'm dyslexic, <coughs> but that usually comes up. Um, do we have te uh, text available tonight, Mr. Producer? We have no straps. I apologize for that. So give me a printout of the, the number at some stage or give it to me in my ear when I'm not talking, please. Uh, okay. Um, what does your guest think about Robert Spencer and Jihad Watch? I, I have a, a lot of, I have an awful lot of uh, respect for Robert Spencer. I've never met him personally. We know each other. We start from the same paradigm. He's a Catholic. I'm a Protestant. Uh, I'm an evangel uh, evangelical Protestant. We don't have, uh, we won't accept everything theologically. What I like about Robert Spencer is that he goes back to the, to the, the original. He goes back to the sources. You have to do that if you're going to be held credible. He is one of the few that is able, he has a whole team that works on always supporting what he says in scripture rather than opinion. I don't have time for people who just have opinions. I want to make sure that they can source what they say. We demand that of our preachers. We demand that of our, our scholars. We should demand that also when we're dealing with other, um, other religions. Now, Robert Spencer is a polemicist. Do you know, the, do you know what that word means? No. It's what I am. We are both polemicists. Um, it's like a football team. You have your defense, you have your offense. Your defense you need. And because if you don't, they score against you and that you lose the game. Our defense in Christianity would be apologetics. Mm -hmm. And we have schools of apologetics. There's lots of schools of apologetics. I did my degree in apologetics. But you don't win games just with defense. You need an As attack. Vince Lombardi said, the best defense is a good offense. Mm -hmm. You need your strikers. You mm -hmm. need your midfielders. That's your polemics in Christianity. So polemics goes the other direction. Now, to be an apologist, you better know the Bible well and you better know Jesus Christ. How to defend those two, the book of the man, the book of the man. To be a polemicist, you better know their book and you better know their right. man. Yes. Unless, Very unless good. if you're not going to know their book, don't be yep. a polemicist. So I ask anybody that's watching, please don't go on the offense unless you have studied Islam. Robert Spencer is one that has. He is a polemicist as well as an apologist. He does both end. And that's the same thing that Paul did. Look what Paul did. 
in the book of Acts. Look at chapter 17 to 19. In every uh, town, whether it's Laodicea, Cappadocia, Berea, there in, in um, Ephesus, he went right into the synagogue, went right up to the, uh, to the leaders there, He's and he striker. confronted them because he knew their scripture. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly. He could quote it better than they could. Let me ask you uh, very quickly, <clears throat> to us who are just laymen uh, uh, in, with the Quran, we don't really understand where to start. I mean, I started at the beginning, and I've done this several times. So I want, to, and I'm thinking, do you know what, this sounds too nice. I just, I know something bad's <coughs> going to come. Where would you start to actually get a proper, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to jump ahead a bit? Well, it depends on why you want to. How, why is it, Howard, you're reading the Quran to begin with? So I can talk to and okay. engage Okay, probably the best the thing is you need to be trained. You need to be trained. Probably the best thing is to take our course. We have a course, founder, oh, foundation right. course. Fantastic. It starts every September. Yeah. September 12th, it'll start. And you need to write to info at Fander, P F A N D E R dot U K. Yeah. We will teach you and train you how to actually unpack the Quran. We'll show you how to exegete it. We'll show you where the major verses are. There are verse after verse after verse that defends the Bible in this, in this Quran. That's Surah really 10, good. Ayah 94. Surah 21, Ayah 7. Right. Surah 4, I, and I could go listen, listen, listen. You need to know those verses. Yeah. Rather than just reading the Quran um, set chapter by chapter, you're going to get confused. The reason why is this. When you read the Quran, Howard, did it make much sense to you? Not a lot. Oh, look, no, having said that, I think there's such a crib from the Old Testament in here, especially, uh, and I would have um, a little bit to, to ask uh, on why they're using the plural. For we. For we. For God. Okay, yeah. we're going to get to that. But the stories that you read about the Old Testament, are they the same stories that you have in the Bible? Not quite. Absolutely not. In fact, you will see, see very That's few stories. That's why I said stories. it's a crib. About 25% of the Quran is biblical material. Yes. What, may, what we think is biblical, but it mm. is not biblical at all. When you look at, let me give you an example. Well, just what we just mentioned earlier, the story of Cain and Abel mm -hmm. killing his brother. That's Surah, 3, uh, Surah 5, Ayah 31. That story is not in our Bible. I don't remember C Cain looking at a raven scratching in the ground and no. following the example. That mm -hmm. comes from the, uh, the Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah, written in the second century. The next verse, the verse 32, that talks about the blood of Abel, and about the redemption of the blood analysis. That comes from the Bar Sanhedrin, which is written in the fifth century, chapter four, verse five, both of which are Jewish apocryphal accounts. How in the world did they get into the Quran? Right. Now, that when you go to the story of Abraham in Surah 21, verse 51 to 71, uh, that's the story of Abraham in Mecca. I had no idea Abraham lived in Mecca. Did you? Not at all. I no. thought he lived 600 miles further north. Yeah, but here he is in Mecca. <laughs> he goes into the Kaaba, he takes a big idol and smashes all the smaller idols. He's, accosted the next morning and thrown into a fiery pit. Abraham in a fiery pit? Isn't that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? There you go. It's a little so bit you've twisted. got the wrong story yeah. with the wrong people. So where does that story come from? It comes from the Mishnah of Rabbah, which is a well-known apocryphal account, Jewish apocryphal writing written in the second century. Look at Jesus. Look at Issa. Yeah. Issa's not even an Arabic name. They've got the wrong name. Mm. Issa means nothing in Arabic. Yeshua is the name in Arabic, which is like Yeshua yeah. in Hebrew. And so is all the Christians, the Christians we now know, because we now have the late, we finally have got, in just this last year, we have now come across the, the earliest Arabic Bible written in Arabic uh, from, uh, I'm going to get the right date, it comes from 867. That's the late 9th century AD, long after the Quran was compiled. And the name for Jesus in that is the Sinai, the Codex of Sinai 151. That's the name of the Codex that was just discovered this year in Mount Sinai at St. Catherine's Monastery. The name for Jesus in that Bible is Yeshua in Arabic. My goodness. Now, this is a good 100 to 150 at years after the Quran correct, was put together. It, you know. So where did Issa come from? Yeah, where? Well, we now know where. It where? comes from Syriac writings. When you look at the stories of Jesus, there he is as a baby speaking from the cradle. He didn't speak from the cradle in Surah 3, Ayah 46. Three verses later in verse 49, he is taking some mud, fashions them into clay, blows on them, and they fly up as birds into the air. Right after it says that he... Now, that's not the Jesus I know. In chapter 19, in Surah 19, he tells his mother how to eat. He tells her, because they're both hungry, he says, take that tree as a baby. He's telling his mother how to shake the tree so the fruit will fall down. Hmm. I had no idea Jesus told his mother how to, how to eat, and nor could he speak from the cradle. So where are these stories from? These are the lost books of the Bible. Arabic, they're written in Syriac, not Arabic. They're Gnostic accounts. 
taken from Syriac and then interposed into the Quran in Surah 3, Ayah 46, Surah 3, Ayah 49, Surah 19. What's interesting, not only do they borrow the story, they borrow the name because the name for Jesus in Syriac is Iesu. And when you take Iesu, you get, get Issa yes, out of that. Now, by doing that, they all not only have the heretical Jesus, they've also got the heretical stories. Now then can you understand when in Surah 4, Ayah 157, Jesus does not get up on the cross, another man dies for him. I and that this. one mm. verse right there, Howard, eradicates everything that I know about my Jesus. Because mm. if he did not die on the cross, we're all dead. We're, it, absolutely, it's what Paul said. Um, let me ask you something which I, I struggle with. When I see uh, and hear about the, the terrorists, especially this in the young radicals, right? Uh, you say that radicals and by um, as definition, a radical uh, Muslim is someone who really knows his Quran. Yeah. All right. And would it adhere to it as, as much as humanly possible? Yeah. Right. Why is it that the young terrorists, when they look into their background, uh, they're either being into drugs or porn or they've uh, known criminals? OK, who told you that? Um, who told you they're criminals? The media. Or no, the media. Where did the media ever really see that? Um, um, well, is it uh, fake news? A lot of it is ancient. Well, a lot of it is nothing more than just that. Howard, what we're finding, and see, I know a lot of these radicals because I meet them all the time. Take so up, they, give, they're not into the things that I've just mentioned? Well, let me just give you an example. This uh, Khalid Masood. I'm talking about the Boston, uh, the well, youngest I'm talking about Khalid well. Masood at Westminster yeah. Bridge. Okay. He was all yep, over the yep. news. Remember him? Yep. And he was a convert to Islam. And he was just this. He was a man who was angered. He was a man in and out of prison. When, when was he last in prison? I did. 13 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So what happened in those intervening 13 years? He became a Muslim. He became a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And it looks like is Islam turned him around. Just the opposite. Why wasn't that in the news? Mm -hmm. See, they were saying this man was angered. He was all over prison. Yes, 13 years ago, it was Islam that actually turned him around. Let me give you another example. Michael Adi mm -hmm. You remember yes, Drummer Rigby? Yeah, yep. There uh, and slit his throat. Slit the, his throat and got out, and then yeah. he did. Then he sat around for 16 minutes and did nothing. He didn't run away. He just talked to the crowd, and that woman uh, filmed okay. him on her yep. uh, her phone. And then he gave her a piece of paper, which said, "Well, why did anybody look to what was on that piece of paper? It was in the news. It was actually brought at his court case. On that piece of paper were verse after verse from the Quran." It was a note to his son explaining why he was doing what he was doing. Now, who is Michael Adi Balajo? He, in 2003, he, he was, was a, a young Christian. Pentecostal, Nigerian mm -hmm. Christian mm -hmm. from Romford here in London. Yep. He had grown up as a Pentecostal Christian, one of us, until he met Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, really? a friend of yours, a friend of mine. Sheikh Omar Bakri met him in 2003 at... Um, uh, um, Tottenham? No, no, in the university, um, Greenwich University, okay. where he was studying. He met, went to a, a meeting that he was at, was converted at the university. And from 2003 to 2013, to that 10-year period, to change him from a Pentecostal, Bible-believing Christian into a radical Muslim. And what did Sheikh Omar Bakri do? He just poured him through scripture after scripture after scripture, showing that if you want to be a good Muslim, follow the book, read the book, follow the man, read the book, follow. That's all he did. He does the same thing that you and I do with Christian young men and women. But that book is what changed him. And it was the reason why he was doing, and he was doing what he was doing. Why did he want to cut off the heads? Because of Surah 47, Ayah 4. Why is it he waited around for 16 minutes and didn't run away? Because he was waiting for the police so he could be a shaheed. Why? Read on verse 6 and 7. And he who participates in jihad, if he shall die, great shall be his reward in heaven. That's the only assurance of salvation you get in Islam. It's right there in Surah 47, Ayah 6 and 7. That's why he wanted to cut off the head, and then he wanted to be killed. He, that's why he ran at the police, and they shot him, but they shot him in the legs. Mm -hmm. And they only wounded him. Now, if you want to understand, don't assume that, uh, take, let, let's, take a, let's take another more notorious case. Let's go and look at um, Jihadi John. Mm -hmm. Jihadi John. Yep. Another Here Englishman. in Kilburn, from yep. Kilburn. Mm -hmm. What school did he go to? A grammar school. St. John's Wood. How oh, was it? He went to one of the best schools in London. Mm -hmm. His parents were wealthy Wealthy, they lived in St. John's Wood and just, I'm uh, sorry, in Kilbert. They lived in the wealthy area. He had the best education. He was not disenfranchised. There was nothing that would say that he was a criminal. He did run around for the gang.
But when he became a radical Muslim, he stopped running around again. He stopped drinking liquor. Everything the police are trying to blame on him is what he did not do. So it seems to me that you're defending them right now. Is that because of your, uh, if you like, respect for truth rather than for propaganda? Howard, I'm not defending them at all. What I'm saying is what is it that changed them? The this book changed them. But you could say that about people who are in prison or have had uh, horrific backgrounds and they've uh, converted to Christianity because of what the Word of God says. But to me, Jesus' words are far more peaceful. Not only far more peaceful, it's the only antidote. Yeah. In fact, I would like to see any other book that can do what the Bible can do. I, show me any other faith, any religion. And this is why I'm saying, can you notice, when you have people like secular or humanists who are trying to understand these radicals, they cannot understand why a book would change somebody, mm. but you can. Because yes, this absolutely. book, if you, every one of us, take a look at the yeah. many testimonies we have of Christians, even Muslims who become Christians, and when they start watching and looking and reading what Jesus said and did. When you look and see what Jesus did, how he dealt with controversy, how he dealt with abuse, how he dealt with violence, in every case, Jesus said, put away this Lord. Yep. For he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. He wouldn't even let his disciples defend him. Peter yeah, wanted yeah. to defend him. Yep. Cut off the ear of that servant. And he put the ear back on the servant and said, Peter, put away your sword. Now that's the example we have in Jesus Christ. If, you can, if we can get people back to this book, if we can, and this, you know, I put these books side by side. Which is the bigger book? <laughs> the Bible. There's a reason I keep it bigger, Howard. <laughs> Go on, it's, it's the, the bigger, print. the better book. Okay. I keep this one small for a reason. So symbolically, you can see which is the better. Right. I, the reason I want to understand uh, as much as I can about the Quran, as I said earlier, is to relate to people, to be able to engage with them. I'm, yeah. not, a, uh, I'm not highly intellectual in, in any way whatsoever, but I do have a heart for people and I do want people to at least know that I, I've read the scripture, yeah. Yeah. The, their, their Quran, um, so that I can actually draw it like for like, if you like, with, right. with scripture. But when you've got um, all that's going on out there with the political correctness and everything, it does seem that at the moment uh, we, we as Christians are also targeted, uh, if you like, or um, disenfranchised some of us because we're seeing that we've been marginalized, pushed away and, and not accepted in mainstream politics or now, as you could see what happened recently uh, with the liberal leader, the ex-liberal leader, uh, Tim Fallon. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's very confusing if for new people that you want to invite to look at uh, who the true God is and, and in particular Jesus Christ, you know, you've got the Quran and the, the Bible. I mean, how, where would you start? Well, I'll say with Howard, a new person. that you've just answered your own question. It is very confusing and difficult to deal with your average Joe Blow on the street. And that's true. And with almost all your English people, yes, I have a hard time really... I, don't ha I get impatient with English people. I get impatient with Europeans. I don't get impatient with Muslims. I'll tell you why. If you go up to a Muslim and you start quoting their scripture, and you start asking questions about their Quran and their Prophet Muhammad, immediately you're going to have a tie. They're going to see that you're a man of God, that you really are interested. And, they're gonna, and then you're going to say, hold on a minute, I'd like to do a comparison between these two books. And I'd like to do a comparison between the two men. I go up to people and I say to, I say to people, and I'll say to your, list, uh, your, your viewers, go up to a Muslim and say two things. I believe that Jesus is God, and I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Do you have an opinion? Now what are you doing? You're setting down and you're stating clearly who you are. I believe in those two things. Now, Jesus, uh, Jesus God. is God, and? and the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, yep. Immediately, you're going to have about three hours worth of questions. <laughs> That's if why he's I a good, Especially with... if he's a radical Muslim. Now, if you were to say those two things to any person on the street, any normal British person, they would probably walk around and walk the other way and probably start saying something to you under their breath with Jesus' name, and it wouldn't be very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about Jesus or the Bible except Muslims. They're the e easiest people to talk to. And all you have to do is make those two statements. Very good. All you need to do. They're the easiest people, and that's the beauty about them. They want to talk about Jesus. Oh, they'll have all kinds of questions about the Trinity, about his Christology, about the, Paul and, the, and the, uh, the creation of Christianity. They'll have a whole litany of questions about the history of, his, of Christianity and about the corruption of Scripture. And that's where we're here to help you out. We have set this course up just to answer every one of those questions. So nobody, anybody who comes across the motion should not have a problem answering any one yeah. of them. 
Do you, know, do you know, I can't believe it. We've nearly got 15 minutes left. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, thank you so much, Jay. Uh, let me just get through some of the emails as well. Evening to, do you think, oh, by the way, thank you, Eddie, for that other email. Uh, uh, evening, do you think the Muslims will one day overtake the Vatican, even if it's temporary, uh, says John? <laughs> not a, I, I'm not going to answer for the Vatican, and I'm not here to defend the Vatican. I'm here to defend Jesus Christ. Will they ever take over the church? No. Because remember, look at the last 2,000 years, Howard. The last 2,000 years, when has the church grown the fastest? When we've been under persecution. Yeah. That's why, mm -hmm. in some ways, I love it the Muslims are becoming more radical. Because in a sense, they're coming home. They're coming home. Because they're going to find out that this book, now we've got some new material that I'm not introduced yet. The reason I'm leaving Britain is I'm going all over the world in about 43 countries because we've got new material that's going to destroy this book. New historical material on the, the earliest manuscripts. We've got new material on Muhammad. This is all historical criticism that we introduced at the, uh, we've been introducing at the corner in the last three weeks. That material, I believe, is the Achilles heel of Islam. We are now at the point where we can destroy uh, academically, mm -hmm. the how, the, who this book, where this book came from, and even how it's changed. But that's something for another time. But they time. would say the same, obviously, about the Bible. That's some, one of their arguments. Oh, I, I engage all the time with a lot of my Muslim. Uh, I play football okay, with them. Okay, let me just do it real quickly right now. Do, what do they say about the Quran? And what do you know about the Quran? Do you know that there's not an original one of this Quran? Well, they say the same about the Bible. Okay. Do you, can, can you, and here's what we love. This is what I love. When a Muslim tells me that, mm -hmm. I say, can you show me one manuscript of this Quran that is the same as this book. Look at the six major manuscripts, and the Muslims know what they are. Mm. That's the top copy, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, and the Husseini, and the uh, Petropolis, and the Sana. Those are the six major manuscripts. We now have them filmed. We now have them photographed. Not one of them is from the seventh century. Not one of them is the same. Not one of them are the same as this book here, and they're, they have thousands of manuscript variants. So no Muslim can say that this book can be traced back to Muhammad. Now, have you ever, ever heard a Muslim admit that? No. no. We're getting them to admit it, and right. where they're coming to the it's Lord because of it. because we don't really know enough. That's the, that's but we do ignorant. know this. This is no, all. No, you do, but, but I'm saying that the but Howard, average Christian this is why doesn't, we need including to get this, myself. This is why we need to get this out. Brilliant. so that everybody could hear it. Right. Okay. Uh, let me go through these emails because I've asked people to write in. So, hi, uh, Howard and friend. That's Jay, by the way. How much trust should we put in the Muslims that are not being watched, you know, under surveillance? Uh, that is the ones that claim to be peaceful people. Personally, I don't think I can trust them. I want to follow the scriptures, but um, how can any sensible person do so? Dave. Thank you, Dave. Well, let me say, let me say to Dave, if you're watching, Dave, I would suggest, Dave, that what you need to do is if you don't trust the Muslim, then ask them questions about their Quran and ask them questions about their Prophet Muhammad. What you will find is they will start engaging with you immediately because now you're interested in what is important to them. And you're going to find that, at least I have found this every time I brought this up, that they will not be able, they will know more about your Bible than you will about their Quran. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is just defend Jesus Christ. Take on their questions and defend him and defend your Bible. By doing that, you're going to probably be the first Christian they've ever met. And they'll tell you that. They'll be surprised that there are any Christians that even know about the Bible or even know how to defend Jesus Christ. And you'll be doing the church a great favor and yourself as well. Mark writes in, he says, uh, who wrote the Quran and do the Muslims believe it is inspired word of Allah? Yep. Uh, the, the, the simple answer is no Muslim knows who wrote it. They, give the, they, give, they, they know that Muhammad couldn't read or write. The man that is given credit to his name, um, his name is Zaid ibn Thabit. Now, Zaid ibn Thabit is the secretary of Muhammad, but we don't have any of the manuscripts from either the 7th century. Even this oldest Quran that was found in Birmingham are two folios uh, that are carbon dated from 568 to 645. That is seven years before the Quran even came into existence. So you've got a problem there, and people, uh, none of the Muslim scholars are jumping up and down about this Birmingham folio. Only the popular press is jumping up in BBC. The problem is we don't have any Quran yet that is the same, any of the manuscripts that are the same. This Quran, the one that we're reading in our hand today, this Arabic, the Arabic Quran that we have in our hand today was put together in 1924. That is 93 years ago. <laughs> Can you see the problem? Prince yeah. Philip is older than the Quran. That was done at Cairo University by a group of scholars at Al-Azhar University in Cairo. Because of that, you can see it's a very new book. That Quran, the Quran, they call it the Hafs Quran, which was put together in 1924, does not agree with any of the six major manuscripts. Now, can you see why these kind of questions need to get out onto the air? Okay. 
Um, Jay Simpson writes in, I keep myself abreast of Islamic news by various websites, the religion of peace, jihad, watch, Acts, 17 apologetics, and Wally Shubat. I find that uh, Wally can give a reasonable interpretation of the news, but I don't know how much of him I should believe because of what he says about Luther and the popes we know uh, were corrupt. He said, but bearing in mind, it might not be possible for you to say too much. Can you suggest how much of his interpretation would be worthwhile? I would be careful. I know uh, Wally Shubat personally. We've worked together. We've been on the same platform together. I have no problem with him. I don't, I, like you, I disagree with some of his interpretation, not only of scripture, but also his interpretation of what's happening today. The one that I re recommend the most uh, would be Apologetics uh, 315. That's a David Wood's uh, website. You can also go on ours on YouTube on Fander Films. That's P-F-A-N-D-E-R Films. And look at all our uh, look at all our YouTubes there. We, are, uh, we, are, we work with David Wood. David takes our material, we take his, and we work side by side. We're running out of time, but let me get through a few more, uh, Jay. Uh, would you say that the Quran takes its name from the source, the tribes of Korah, who sold Joseph into Egypt? Ask Brian. No, the Quran is the Qur'a, means the reciting. That's it just it's the word in Arabic for that. It when when did when did it get that name? We don't even know because it uh, that is uh, that is something that was probably attributed by, in, in the eighth or ninth century and redacted back onto this book here. Uh, but as I said just a, a, just a five minutes earlier, this book, the Quran that we have in our hand today, was only put together in 1924. Mm. I think this is from a Muslim, uh, which is uh, really good that you writing and thank you. Uh, very strange as growing up, terrorists were Irish Christians, there were no bad Muslims before they decided to bomb Muslim countries, uh, weren't, I'm um, reading uh, correctly, uh, weren't George Bush and Tony Blair um, against Christians, they killed millions of innocent civilians. Please concentrate on filling your churches with spreading love as I can see most churches are empty yeah. Becoming uh, uh, whoever this Muslim is, I would say very carefully, be careful about saying that Islam has not been violent. I would go back to your Prophet Muhammad's example in Medina. Go back to 627 in Medina and see what your Prophet did in, in 624, 625, and 627, those three years. Look what he did to the Jews living in Medina, the Banu Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, and then the Banu Quraiza family. Remember, Muhammad was not from Medina, he was from Mecca. By Within five years, he had thrown out Two of the Jewish tribes, the last remaining Jewish tribe, the Banu Qurayza family, he took all 800 men and slit their throats, took the women as, uh, and children as uh, concubines and also slaves. Now, I can give you now five sources for that. You can go to Ibn Hisham, you can go to Al-Wakiri, you can go to Al-Bukhari, you can go to Al-Tabari, and you can go to uh, Sahih Muslim. I've given you five sources from three different uh, genres. I've given you the Sirah, I've given you the Hadith, and I've given you the Tafsir. You're a Muslim, you know what I'm talking about. Go back and see what your Prophet Muhammad did to the Jews. Within five years of moving Medina, there were no Jews left. Now, we call that genocide. If you believe that, Joseph, uh, that Bush or any of the others are guilty, why is it you don't condemn your Prophet then? Because he, the, he, nobody in the, no prophet I know in the Bible ever committed genocide. And Jesus, my goodness, did he ever use any violence? No. He p told us to put away the sword. Come on back to Jesus. Much better model than Muhammad. Mm. Uh, Dina writes in, she says, uh, have you read Nabil Qureshi's uh, book? Yes, Nabil and I are very good friends. Uh, his book, which is called uh, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, is a bestseller. If you, any of you want to read one book, read that book. Pray for Nabil Qureshi, he is on his deathbed. Uh, mm -hmm. He is dying and we need to pray him home again and we need to have, make sure he has a good home coming, coming or if God can heal him. Uh, this is a good friend and he's a, been a treasured uh, a colleague with me, but we do need to pray for him. Okay, do that, Church Without Walls, please. Um, have you written any books uh, also, Austin? My doctoral thesis, yeah. it is gonna go in print, but I'm gonna be now going to the States and writing lots of books. Most everything do is on videos. Do keep in touch with us. Even if we can do interviews with you from now on, on Skype, really. We'd Jay. love to, love okay, to. Okay, fantastic. For the first time I conversed with a Muslim last week, he was very willing to engage. Our differences were based on believing the Bible as the truth and that Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. He couldn't accept that Father God is love and desires a relationship. Bottom line, he couldn't accept that his God can be called Abba Father. 
Um, this is from Angela. So Angela, this is hugely important. This is really the biggest, one of the biggest difference. I won't say it's the only big difference. It's one of the biggest difference between Islam and Christianity, and that is the two gods we worship. And we are finding that more Muslims are coming to Jesus Christ because they are finding for the first time that the God of the Bible is a God that you can relate to face to face. The God of the Bible is a God that you can talk to on any day, at any time, in any place, in any language, in any direction. But you cannot do that with the God of Islam. Allah of Islam never has come to earth, has come, is completely other, is completely distant. There is no relationship, has never been a relationship, is so totally other that they don't even know what he looks like or even who he is. They only know him by his 99 names. Now, can you see then why the God of our, the God that we're worshiping, Abba, which means daddy, my goodness, what an attractive God we have. But this God comes down our direction, speaks our language, lived amongst us for 33 years, died and rose again because, for, because of the love He had for us. Where do you see that in Allah of the Quran? Not at all. Bring it home and bring that your friend home and show them and just let them fall in love with Jesus. I can't think of a better answer. Great you brought that up. Thanks yeah. so much, Angela. Because we had trouble with our texts uh, tonight coming on your screens, uh, info at Paflanda. UK. Yeah, it's info, I-N-F-O, at P-F-A-N-D-E-R dot U-K. Yeah, so please uh, do contact uh, Jay's organization, and that is the Pafanda Center of Apologetics. And I'm looking forward to um, getting in touch with you uh, with regards to signing up to the, you know, the, If anybody the wants to do the course, it starts on... September 12th, and it goes right to April. So it's every Tuesday afternoon from 2 to 4.30. We will come to your, we come to you. So we come to your laptop, wherever you are in the world. You can be anywhere in the world. Right. We right now oh, have 140 good. students in 21 countries. Yeah. How We're many? Just last in, uh, we have 140 students in 21 countries right now. We just finished our last our last um, lecture last Wednesday. So we're starting up again on, on September. And for the whole year, it's 200 pounds for the whole year. Very so good. do get in touch with us. Yeah. We will then not only give you the video, you will have the video, you'll have PowerPoints, and you'll have the outline for every lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a little slow because I'm dyslexic, so I hope that doesn't You're not hold slow. Up. You've been perfectly okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I want to learn. Um, I've done... Uh, I've read, took me two and a quarter years to read the Bible, you know, Jay, because I'm <laughs> dyslexic. So, but I, I wanted to take it in, not just read it. You wanted to assimilate it's it. It's the first book I ever read in my life when I was Is that 21. So? Well, what, what better book would you want to read than that? Nothing better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Jay, um, let me ask you, the, the Trinity, this is one of the biggest mm -hmm. uh, hold-ups for, for the Muslim to come to terms with Christianity anyway. Well, how do you deal with that? Very simply, I don't ever get into a debate. I've never done a debate. I've done 80 debates with Muslim scholars around the world. I've never ever debated the Trinity for one very reason. You can't debate the Trinity. The only way you can understand the Trinity is to open Bible. Just open up scripture. Start with the very first chapter. Start with the very first verse. In the beginning, gods, Elohim, plural, three or one. Yep. Yet bada, the very next, the verb that follows it is singular. So here is a plural God, God who refers to himself in the plurality, yet is creating as one. You can go down to verse 26 and 27. Let yeah. us create yeah, man exactly. in our image, plural, in his image. That's singular. Yeah. So you can start going right through scripture and seeing that all the way through. Now, Dr. Paul Blackham, who is, uh, has a church here, he's now starting next month here near the Emirates Stadium. Probably the best man I know. You need to get him on your mm. show. He will unpack the Trinity for you better than anybody else I know. This is part of his doctoral thesis. But what I like to do is, I, for Muslims, I say, listen, you tell me who your Allah is. And he has 99 names. What are the three most important names? Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Al-Wadud. Al-Rahman is the compassionate, the, mer the merciful one, the loving one. Compassion, mercy, loving. Those are his eternal names. That means they don't begin, they don't end, they've always been. They define who he is. Now, by definition, if compassion, mercy, and love, don't they need an object? Yes. They do. So where is the object to his compassion, mercy, or love before Adam and Eve were created? Mm. The only way I can know of that course. is to come back to the Trinity. Yes. Come back to my God, mm -hmm. who is, has always been loving. God the Father has always loved God the Son, who has always loved God the Holy Spirit. In communion, there is the fellowship. Now, if we're made in his image, that's where we get fellowship. That's where we get love. So we come in the back door using those three names. Every time I've used that with a Muslim, find the, 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 the light shown and they ah, so that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Right. We've got uh, probably 
30 seconds left. Yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, ask you if we can quickly get this one in. Um, how do you explain the rapture to a Muslim? I don't think you should. I don't think you need to. I don't think that's important. That's not something that they should begin with. What you need to do is you need to start with the person of Jesus Christ and you need to go and start with God himself. So don't worry about the rapture. That's something that will come much later. Thank you. Jay, thank you very much indeed. We wish you all the best. Do keep in touch. Thank you and good night for being with us today.